the Lord. You know, the scripture is filled with the acts of God, right? Just all throughout. I think that we we can get caught up in this modern age where we're we're reading a book and we're contemplative and we talk a lot. (laughs) But don't forget, God is a God of action, right? You've done great things all through history. Just the fact that we exist God has created all things, and he's in all things, and he's there. And we're like, oh, what's going on in my life? And <laughs> He's a God of action. He does things. He's not just there. He's not just simply the comforter. 
He actually is the one who will do something about it. Make changes. Changes you can see. Changes you can feel. Changes that are, are clearly evident. That is the God that we serve. Amen. Amen. Well, <laughs> welcome to church, right? <laughs> I feel like here sometimes church just hits you right in the face. <laughs> um, let's go before the Lord in prayer and, and ask for his, uh, his guidance and input today and his, his hand of power. Hallelujah, Lord. Already, just have our eyes on you just in one song. Just, I ask for today, Lord, in the worship, for just beautiful, beautiful times of worshiping you, Lord. We bow our knee before you. That is an absolute choice. My pride wants me to run the other way, and I choose to put my knees on the ground before you and submit my life to you. Hallelujah. And in so we're going to sing, and we're going to praise, and we're going to cry if we need to cry, and we're going to dance if we need to dance. Lord, I ask today that you would just do <laughs> what you do, even if I don't, that you would move in this place, and that you would change us, you would call us, you would arrange the conversations that need to happen, that you would be there in all of that, and uh, God, we trust you completely for that. Lord, I pray even for the message even now, I just pray that, that would, those words come out clearly from you and that they hit right where they're supposed to hit and that doors are unlocked and things are exposed and people are set free. I just can't wait. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Lord, we dedicate this entire service to you and we just thank you and praise you and all God's people said, amen. amen.
of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double cure Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill the law's commands. Should my passion never Oh 
the rock of ages. The rock of ages. Left for me. Left for me. Left behind. Hide in Jesus. Hide myself in thee. Hide myself in thee. He's the rock of ages. He's the rock of ages. Left for me.
How many of you were here for the first two in this series on spiritual warfare? Before we actually start, if you have not yet had a copy of this trifold about an overview of the battle that I wrote many years ago, uh, please take it because it is filled with the scripture references. Tuck it in your Bible. The reason why I put this together is because so often as we try to uh, grasp what the invisible world is like, it's, it's hard to imagine and see what is spiritual because what is spiritual is not physical and it is different. And especially when you hear and read in Revelations and various books of the Bible where it describes these angelic beings and heavenly hosts, seraphim and cherubim and many wings. And they're using uh, words and description that we can try to understand and visualize. But they are far more glorious and amazing. And these angels, and even when it talks about demons, which I will be talking about today, in this pamphlet, it talks about the characters in this battle, you know, God against uh, uh, the devil and the kingdom of darkness and Satan. And there are aliases for the devil. Satan, Lucifer, the prince of power of the air, Beelzebub, a lord of flies. There are many different references, the dragon, in the scripture, these aliases, and it is referring to the same entity, all right, this created entity. And uh, when it comes to speaking about Satan's angels, it gives the aliases of that, principalities, powers of darkness, powers and dominions. They are not necessarily demons. I know that what we teach here is what the Bible says declaratively. And what the Bible does not define, we dare not define, right? Some things are the Lord's. And when we get to heaven, we will have eternity to investigate and try to comprehend these amazing creations that God has made. Uh, but in this pamphlet, we talk about the origin of each one of these characters and entities. We talk about their purpose and their characteristics. And I give lots of scripture verses for you to look up that give credence to why we say what we do say. Now, sometimes people write books and they write books and they simply build on, the, on what they have learned from others. Much of what is taught in spiritual warfare and, in the, and even in Christendom, sadly, is simply regurgitated information that they were taught in Bible college. And there are particular um, thoughts and understandings of certain things such as eschatology, some, such as the typology, and some of the things that are not yet revealed that somebody has found from the scripture and has a particular position on and they have codified it, they've written it, they've put it in the notes, side notes of study Bibles and uh, we who study the scriptures read our Bible and we go, well, what does this mean? And we read on the side and what somebody did in 1800, well, that explains it and we aren't Berean about it we simply take what a couple verses here and there and a whole filled in all the detail. I don't want to do that. And so when it comes to demons, I'm going to say right up front that their origin 
I'll just read what it says out of the pamphlet before I even start this message for you. Demons are disembodied spirits that seem to have an intense craving to cause evil of every kind. Now that is, that is, that is uh, a truth. Their aliases are evil spirits, devils or tormentors. Their origin, as in Colossians 1 verse 15, they're created by God before Earth's creation. At that time, they were not evil. Because God never did not create anything that was evil. All right? Their purpose is to bring people into bondage to the evil appetites they propagate, therefore serving Satan's interest. And because of this, they are aligned with him against God. And then the scripture references. And Demons seem to receive vicarious pleasure from tormenting and generally ruining a person's life. This is a note that I want you to know because I'm not going to tell you their origin. You read through the brochure. It, many people teach that demons are fallen angels. Demons are not necessarily fallen angels because an angelic spiritual being is totally adequate within itself. It does not need to attach itself to an individual or an animal to be able to manifest its power. It can morph, it can uh, uh, manifest itself in various ways. It is a entity that is just totally okay to function in the spiritual realm and it actually interacts with the physical realm. Angels, that is. And fallen angels still maintain that same characteristics. Whereas a demon is of unknown origin. Since the Bible does not say, I am not going to say. And I believe it is inappropriate just because you want to find an answer for everything that you somehow grab onto a particular book and go, okay, demons are fallen angels. No, nope. they are principalities and powers, rulers and dominions. I talk about all that stuff in here. And so it's sort of like an overview of everything. And I encourage you to read through it Check it out. With that, today, I'm going to be doing the third and final in a, uh, the series I've been doing on spiritual warfare, deliverance, setting the captive free. Uh, up until now, we've learned about the two spiritual kingdoms that war for the souls of men. We've discovered how to recognize the devil and his deceptive traps and tactics. And we've also examined the spiritual equipment that God has provided Christians to not only defend ourselves from these invisible to us, these spiritual beings, not only to defend ourselves, but overcome and defeat the enemy, this ancient adversary who is out to destroy all that God has made. A big part of Jesus' ministry on earth was setting people free from demons. He, in fact, one quarter of all the recorded acts of Jesus in the New Testament was involved delivering people from demonic oppression and influence. Casting demons out. And you go, how macabre is that? How old world ancient thought is that? That there are demons that somehow are attaching themselves to individuals and in some way influencing and controlling them with that person's initial complicity sometimes. And we're going to talk about that. We, you should never say that because a demon has attached itself to you because of whatever reason, we're going to talk about that later, 
to blame your actions on a demon. You know, it happened to be that, uh, who was that? Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson. It made, a, made a real parody. <laughs> You'd do something bad. you go, oh, the devil made me do it. No, the devil can't make you do anything. He certainly can influence. He can certainly tempt. He can, he can, he can push. He can pressure. You might be a slave in certain areas of your life, but the devil cannot make you. And I say the devil, I mean demonic spirits, because the devil doesn't know your name. You are a nobody to him. He is a finite person with one place at one time. He is ruler, a powerful adversary, but he's ruling the kingdom of darkness. All right? But... There are demonic spirits in this spirit world of darkness, this spiritual world of darkness, that are very loosely controlled because it's like herding cats because they are not very uh, righteously motivated, let's just say. They are carnally and appetite and, and rebellion motivated, self-motivated. But out of fear, they are controlled all right, and the enemy knows how to control those demons based on their desires as he has, knows how to control you and I based on your carnal desires. So make sure you understand that, that the demonic spirits that affect and attach people is a real thing. And Je how do we know this? Because Jesus addressed people and saw that part of their problems, whether it be physical or spiritual or social interactions, was because they were in some way slaves to appetites or demonic spirits. So Jesus spent a quarter of his ministry actually speaking to individuals about their souls, but then addressing the demonic spirits that held them captive and telling it in the name and to leave by, by the finger of God. And it's an awesome thing, but it is very true that Jesus, a big part of his ministry, was deliverance, setting the captive free. And let's read in Mark 1, 34 through 39, and he, that is Jesus, healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And he went into their synagogues and throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. In Luke 11, verse 14, and he, that is Jesus, was casting out a demon, and it was mute. But when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. Some illnesses that people have are not physiological in nature. The world ends up saying, okay, it's psychosomatic, you know, they're, they're you know, it's, it's in their head. Well, it's true. It's in their head, or sometimes it's what has them, what's speaking to their mind, what's controlling them, brings them into a state of bondage, even in the physical areas. So sometimes demonic manifestations manifest in physical illnesses or maladies. In Mark 16, verse 9, now after... He had risen early on the first day of the week. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Often there are more than one demon that attaches itself to an individual and controls them. We have demons of, of lust, demons of anger, demons of hate. And though we would label them with a name that matches the, the wicked characteristic that they have, like demons of gambling or pornography. Uh, these are various things. It does not necessarily mean that that's their name. They go by, hi, from one demon to another. Uh, hi, lust. No, no, they're just uh, entities. But we see them and understand them based on what their characteristics are. So, Question, 
What should we do about the many victims who are in some way bound by demonic oppression? What should we, who are free in Christ, do about the victims who are in some way under the influence of demons? Well, the answer is this. God desires to set them free. As he set you free when you first gave your heart to the Lord in some way. God desires to set them free and he wants to use you and me to deliver them. <laughs> Actually, practical, tactical, spiritual warfare is deliverance. All of this stuff that I'm talking about to let you in on, to pull the veil back from what is going on in the invisible world, is not for you to go, oh, I know what's happening. But he wants you to literally engage in spiritual warfare. That you can't fight against the principalities and powers in the air. The angels of God are fighting against those. But what we can do is when we encounter, as Jesus did, those who are spiritually bound by demonic spirits, which we have authority over, that God gave every believer the right to be able to command them to leave. All right? We are to engage in tactical and practical spiritual warfare. That means we are to have as our goal to set free those who are bound by Satan. Can I have an amen? You, it's free. You, anyone who uh, today that wants to encourage or confirm the truth, I would like to hear amens from some people because I know that some of you believe this strongly. It says in Mark 16, 15 through 17, he, that is Jesus, said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. There are other things that will accompany them, but I want to make sure that you understand that you who have believed in the gospel that the disciples communicated and that those followers of Christ have continued to communicate through the years and we've received salvation it is we who've received that are the ones who will cast out demons out of those who are bound okay question what is a demon a demon is an evil spirit that tries to parasitically attach itself to a physical host in order to influence and express or act out the carnal appetite that drives it, whether it be anger, lust, or bitterness. The reason I say that an entity, a physical host, because it's not only humans who demons sometimes attach themselves. You remember the story about when Jesus um, cast out the demon out of the man who had legion, who had many, many of them in him? And the demons communicated to Jesus as he was speaking to them, please don't send us uh, into the uh, abyss or, or the pit before our time which Jesus would not do, because there will come a time where all of Satan and his angels and demonic spirits will be forever sealed in hell. That's what God made hell for, not you. Amen. You, he didn't make hell. Oh, I'm going to make hell and it will be for you. He made that as a, a creation after the angelic spirits in the heavenlies fell. He did that because he's good and he's appropriate to take rebellion against God and put it in a place where it will be forever punished. All right? That's justice. So, back to the point. He didn't make it for you, but you will end up in hell along with the demons forever punishment if you reject and your rebellion reject God and his ways. 
But my initial illustration alluding to this story, when Jesus cast the demons, legion, many of them, out of the demoniac, they, it's called in the scriptures, they said, please don't send us there before his time. Of course, Jesus wouldn't. Will you send us into the pigs over there? They were grazing a whole herd of swine. It wasn't in Israel, I'll tell you. It was outside of Israel proper. Uh, and he, he obliged them, and he had those demons go and enter into a host because they want to be in and attached to something. And they went into those pigs, and of course, it caused panic and, and chaos and destruction, and the whole herd ran down and plunged into the sea and drowned. And the people didn't like that because they're, they were making money off this and, of course, leave the town. They could care less about the de demoniac that happened to have been freed. But, so that's the reason why we say that a demon attaches itself to a physical host in order to express or act out the carnal appetites that drive it. So how do they enter? They enter a person in many ways, dabbling with the occult, or engaging in evil practices, or something sometimes as a result of trauma, terror that happens to you. You, if you are not relying on God for your protection, put your faith in him, sometimes a person might be uh, in this time of opening up Trauma, sometimes a demonic spirit, if they are not properly protected in, underneath the blood of Jesus and in a home that is, is, is righteous, they, a demon can actually take advantage of that injury there and, and come into them. Or a person might be born with them. Well, you say, what are you talking about? Numbers 14, verse 18. The Lord is long-suffering, and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations. This verse on generational sins sometimes is a very practical thing. And you as parents should think twice before engaging in sin, and pay attention to your children, they may find themselves fighting the generational demons that you have at times secretly submitted to. You think that you, as their caregiver and provider and protector, it's okay for when they go to bed, you go slip into your room and turn on things on the, and watch things on your on your computer, and you think that there's no consequence. Your actions open up in your home spirits of darkness, and, and, and if you continue in that, will attach themselves and bring you into a slavery to various sins, whether it be sucking on a bottle or taking prescription drugs in excess, not because you just had surgery and need to get better and that's, so you can get free, but because you just got addicted to this stuff, and this is, fun, this is just easier in life when you just sort of numb yourself. And, and, and the things that you're doing that are not against God, you are in some ways inviting willfully demonic spirits to attach themselves to you and make you a slave. And they will hang around your house. And they will sometimes attach themselves because of the proximity to your children. They, uh, I've seen it. I'll tell you what. Happened to be that one time, many years ago, some from, someone from the community heard that, that I do deliverance. I would pray for people. And I usually don't pray for people who are not underneath the spiritual care that I have because I don't know them, and I don't know that they're going to be maintained. And, and a lot of times, the reason that they're afflicted is because they are not under authority, and they are not underneath covering, all right? But this person called me, and they, they, they let another family they knew who had a child who was about eight years old who was demonized. 
a small diminutive boy. And the family had, it was a rural community and, and very much a healthy environment and home and not exposing itself to all the things that you would think on the internet. There was no way that this person, this child, would have been exposed to anything demonic. But somehow, it ended up being, they asked if they could meet with me. And I said, I want to talk to the parents first. So I had a meeting with the parents, and in finding, in talking to the parents, the Holy Spirit gave me a word, and they said, everything's fine. He spoke to my heart, and he says, that, that man, this is what he's doing, blah, 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 and you, yourself, are in slavery to a demonic spirit. And you, the wife, you have been doing this, this, and this, and you have a demonic spirit as well. And you wonder how your child in your home, somehow was a victim of demonic activity. This child had actually was kicked out of, of schools. He was un, un, unrestrainable, uh, violent, uh, and they said, you can't come to school. I mean, it was, it was that tragic. She, they woke up at times and with, a, with a knife over top of the parents, this, with, about ready to stab the, the parents. They, they were tra- traumatized. They even called some person they don't know. They heard about, maybe there's freedom. And as I talked to them, the man acknowledged it. Yep, you're right. I'm bad. And I said, I'll pray for deliverance for you. The woman said, no, that's not me. You're, you're wrong. I said, Go home. Calls up later and says, I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> okay, let's, let's deal with this. Got free. Then I went over to the, uh, the house sat in the house, and as I, I said to the parents, since he's a young child, you watch, but you get out of the room, you sit over there and you watch. And I talked to the young man and said things. And he's describing this play friend that he had, imaginary play friend that he has, and he would talk to all the time. And uh, he described him as blue and, and uh, creature. And, and I, t- I talked about, in a very kind way, you know, you don't want to freak out a kid. Okay, parents, don't freak out those, your children. Talk to your kids. Demons are addressed in, off to one side. And it's not, you don't want to traumatize your children. You don't want to bring fear in there. But I, I said, well, you love Jesus. You know, see, God has angels, right? Yeah, yes, he's a Sunday school boy. Yeah, I, angels are good, you know. And, and, but you know what? There is a, the devil, and he does have angels as well, and demonic spirits and stuff. You know, there's, there's war going on, you know. Da, 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 da. And as I'm talking to him, out of his mouth he says, to the horror of his parents, the angels are bad, demons are good, I want to have a demon in me. Well, I never said anything. And I, not, doesn't blow your hair back. You just go, okay, I'm speaking to a demon. Uh, and, but I ended up quietly said, no, they are not. This is what, in, in Jesus' name, this is the truth. It was calm, not exorcist, spin your head around, tied to the bed. That's not, the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Please don't go into a wrestling match and let, let, let them throw a tantrum. Same way that you would discipline a child. Would you let them go into a big tantrum or say, no, go to your room right now or give you a spanking, all right? But you do not go allow them to go up throw a tantrum. But a devil is going to throw a tantrum. He's going to try to do all kinds of things and have you engage in the physical, wrestle. No, no, no. In, I said, no, in Jesus' name, very calmly, da-da-da-da. And I basically talked a little bit and told the demons to leave, da-da-da-da. Now, years later, this boy ended, oh, it was radical change in this boy. Totally delivered and set free. He ended up doing well in life. I've watched it through the years. And so I thank God. But I say that story because parents, you are a gatekeeper for your children, if they say children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, that you, in essence, you are, children obey them until they come to an age of accountability where they're looking at you. God to them is you, even though you, you point to God, you know? So please do not open the door. I want to make sure that you all catch that. Do you understand? Can I have a, an, I got it? Throughout history and in every culture, there has been an awareness of demons. 
But in our atheistic culture, postmodern time, many try to give only natural explanations for demonic, deviant manifestations. But if you trust the words of Jesus, you should believe that they are real and learn how to deal with them. It's the reason why we're doing this. The scripture warns us that in the last days there will be an increase in demonic activity. It says in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and, and listen to seducing spirit. That means tricky. Slip in there. Find a way. She'll listen to a seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I will tell you, there are doctrines of devils being preached from many of the pulpits in this country right now. And, and the theological seminaries are laying hands on and, and releasing proteges of doctrines of devils. We need to go back to what the Word of God say and trust what he says instead of what a psychologist has to say. Psychiatry and psychologists are, do pretty good at coming up with a description. Oh, they're a narcissist. They're, you know, uh, they're this. They're the, they're, they can describe the disease very well. And you can go, yep, that's me. That's that person. That's that person. But they do not have the answer because they're only looking at the physical manifestation. And when you end up taking a physical solution for a spiritual problem, you are setting yourself up for bondage. How many people do we walk around that are dead in spirits because they're on the, the Valiums and the, and the various uh, types of mood-altering drugs? And I tell you, it's very sad. We need to have people alive that are led by the Spirit, filled with God, and given the ability because of a relationship with God to take every thought captive and end up putting to death the works of the flesh, even the things that seem rational to the brain. It, you might feel that way, but the truth of the Word of God says, this is what you should do. Praise the Lord. Worship God and tell the enemy to get out of here and then act right. Allow the Spirit of God. Live by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh and you won't walk, away in a, walk around in a stupor. The world and media is fascinated with the spiritual world. <laughs> Look at the programs. Almost everything is demonic. They've got that dialed in really good. But watching and even a curious engagement with these occult practices opens you up to demonic oppression. Don't be watching those shows and going, oh, this is cool. I'd like to find out... Don't let them suddenly seduce you and show you what the spiritual world looks like because it's a perversion of it. It is in some ways a revelation of it, but it's a twisted one. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 through 12, it says, There shall not be found with you anyone that uses divination, which is fortune-telling, or an observer of times, a soothsayer, or an enchanter, a magician, or a witch, which is a sorcerer or sorceress, or a charmer, which is a hypnotist, or a consulter with familiar spirits, which is a medium with a spirit guide. New Age filled with that, having spirit guides. Or a wizard, that's a clairvoyant, or a psychic. Or a necromancer, that's a medium who consults with the dead. Speaks to those that supposedly were dead. But it's not, because he's speaking when they do that to a familiar spirit who knows all about the entity that you want to talk to, because it's been shared that information with another spirit. With that, they have familiar spirit, and they're able to tell you stuff that nobody would know about. But it is not the person you're speaking to. Because once dead, you cannot breach that gulf. You cannot speak to the dead. You are speaking to a familiar spirit. The Bible is against that. 
ending for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Can we say that together? It's an abomination to the Lord. Don't be curious. Oh, I'm just going to end up calling the, the, you know, the, my, my fortune online. Don't do this stuff. You can become demonized by doing that. There's never been a time in history when the warning against the dangers of occultism is more necessary than the present. Many people, even some so-called Christians, in attempting to get relief from the physical or emotional pain, have turned to psychics and hypnotists and new age healers and their techniques. And these are not new techniques, but they're the same old occult practices that have been repackaged for our time and made glamorous. Although they may provide temporary relief, eventually they will bring those who expose themselves to their influence into more bondage and spiritual oppression and depression than the cure, their cure, is worse than the disease. Because they might give you a little bit of bait to get you there till they put their trap around you and then they've got you. Much of the intense ministry that I've been involved with through the years has been in some ways beginning with setting someone free from demonic oppression. When I talk to the ministry, to those I minister, I go, okay, what's happening to them? And they share all the pain, problems that they, snares that they are, that they've been fighting against. I have them repent. And then I cast the demonic spirit and have them say and reject it and resist it. I command them to leave. And only then can they be free to, without the encumbrances of the demonic influences, Run the race fighting the flesh because you cannot cast out the flesh. And you can't crucify or mortify a demon. <laughs> so you have to know what you're dealing with. First of all, let's get clean. Some may think, how in the world, how in the world can a Christian have a demon? A Christian can't have a demon. God's in there. Yes, they can. And I'm going to tell you a, a, a scripture here that talks about how deliverance is for Christians. It's for those who are following God. It says in Matthew 15, through 28, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. And we already addressed the fact that it says demon-possessed, but that is a mistranslation. It, from the, the original Greek, it was a person under the influence, under the control. It's not a matter of owning. But he did not answer her word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. And, but he answered and said, said to her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's Jesus' primary ministry was Israel, first of all. Those who were God's people before this, we all got grafted in, of course. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, that's pretty bogue, as I used to say. That's pretty cold. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs on the feet on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as, you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. It says she was healed, but it was a demon that had tormented and attached itself to him. The story and the meaning of this is such. Deliverance is the children's bread. 
It's not the right of the world to be set free. As they follow Christ, freedom, yes. It is for God's children. God saves us. It's wonderful. Then he cleans us up. We are made holy because of faith in Christ. But I tell you, when I came into this world, I was a screaming, messy, hot mess. I, I was about as messy as your little kids are. There are a lot of work and a lot of trouble, and always, it's all about them, and the thing is making a mess everywhere they go. Right? Can I have an amen for that? But you love them, right? The same way God loved me. And he started working on me, training me, disciplining me, bring me to a place. God saves us, and then he cleans us up. I would never cast an evil spirit out of someone who did not first renounce their sin, own it, and then turn their heart to Jesus. Then I would have deliverance. Otherwise, it would be spiritual malpractice. You may ask, how can an evil spirit dwell inside of someone and the Spirit of God simultaneously? You should not think of yourself as a container. That's not the way you should think of yourself as you talk about this, this demonic oppression and, and those who are demonized. Rather, you should think of yourself as a house with many rooms. And you may have invited Jesus to be a Lord of your house as much as you, you know, you were presented the gospel, and, you know, follow me, you know. How many of you knew the cost, really, when you, gave, when you said yes to Jesus? Ah, I didn't. I just said, help me, God, I'm going to hell, and it's terrible, and all the oppression, blah, 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 blah. help me, I'll do anything. <laughs> sure, you'll do anything. Okay, I said, yes, I give my life to you 100%, as much as I could. But then I got faced, oh, you mean that too? Not that too? No, excuse me? No, we come in part. That's, that's where we start. But if we, you know, you may have invited Jesus to be Lord of your house, but you may have reserved a room or two for the sin you were unwilling to give up. Yeah, but that too. You need nothing but Jesus because he will lead you and make you free and give you everything in due time at the right time. Hold on to everything with your hands wide open. All right? You say, well, what's the scripture for what you're talking about? The fact that... that we're supposed to see ourselves as a house when it comes to demons, and they might have a, a room there. Well, let's read Matthew 12, 43 through 45. When an un, this is Jesus speaking. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, because he's, he apparently cast it out, it roams through waterless places looking for rest, but doesn't find any. In other words, it tries to find a host to attach itself. It is not okay. It's, it's, it's a disembodied spirit of some kind with a carnal appetite. And it's going, ah, I want to express myself. I want to torment someone. So it tries to find someone. But it goes around and it says, ah, they're, all, they're all in Georgetown Christian Fellowship praising God and casting out demons. I, I can't get anything. Well, I'm going to go down the street a little bit. They wander around trying to find a place. It says... It roams through waterless places looking for rest, but it doesn't find any. Then it says, I'll go back to my house that I came from, the person that I was cast out of. And it returns. It finds the house vacant, swept, and put in order. <laughs> they were saved. Hallelujah. Then it goes off. Be now, you notice it says it was vacant. A person gives his heart to the Lord and gets set free. Fill it with God. Every room. But if you hold on and say, yeah, I'm going to keep this door open in case I, you know, you know I'm not going to burn that bridge. Yeah, it might be a time where I might need a, a little, little entertainment or a little muse of sin or something. I'll keep that one open. The enemy comes back. Huh, Jesus isn't is occupying that room. That room is his. So let's read what it says. It goes back to the house where it came from and returned. It finds the house vacant, swept, and put in order. Then it goes off and finds, brings with it seven other demons more evil than itself. Then they enter and settle down there. And the result, the man's last condition is worse than the first. 
Wow. When I was 15, I gave my heart to the Lord. I became a Christian. I repented, and God set me free, and he filled me with the Spirit. It was awesome. But after a time, I foolishly and willfully did some of the very things I was delivered from. And the Spirit was delivered from the spirits that I was a slave to before. And they came back, and they brought others. It was terrible. It was, it was tormenting. I knew what freedom was like, and I was back a slave to these demonic spirits that were controlling me. It had ruined my life. It was terrible. I needed deliverance again. Thank God there were some Christians that my father knew, and he arranged for me to go and, and have some deliverance again, and they cast the demons out. Some of you in this very room are, were set free once, and you were free. And... You've gone back to the very sin and opened the door to the same demonic oppression that you did before. And you need deliverance because you're in a worse state than you were before. It's not going to get better until you quit the sin, repent, and ask God to come in and kick out the horde that happens to be ruining your life. Deliverance is the children's bread. Not the world's. It's your right to be free. It's available if you repent and turn from your sin and ask for prayer. This is not going to be like poltergeist or head spinning. It's just someone in the name of Jesus says, no, you will leave now. Go. Right now, every spirit of darkness that is, is attached to some of you here, I bind you in Jesus' name. You be quiet because they are listening with their spirit to what the word of God says about them. And, the, and, they are, and, and they are listening to the words of life that will bring freedom and deliverance for you. So every spirit, you be silent now. I bind you in Jesus' name. Some in this room... Others, this series is an eye-opener, an understanding, an unmasking of the spiritual world. And with new eyes, you will begin to recognize those who are captive and need deliverance. You're going to see that. You will notice those bound by fear. You'll notice those who are slaves to anger. And slaves to addictions of various kinds. The chains that hold them are often more than the substance they, substances they abuse or the sin that amuses. It's more than the substances they use or the sin that amuses you. It is a demonic spirit that has attached itself, sometimes severally, to you. And that is what you're dealing with. Romans 6 verse 16 says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as a slave for obedience, when you do what's wrong willfully, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, these spirits of darkness, either of sin resulting in death, and because that's what it's all going to lead to, or obedience to God resulting in righteousness. What you submit to enslaves you. The sin you submit to soon becomes your master. But Jesus gave us power and authority and the commission to set the captive free. And Mark 16 again says this, Mark 16, 15 through 20, and he said to them, go into all the world, preach the good news to all creation, and whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak with new tongues. We speak with tongues in this church. 
And hopefully, and that's available to you as you are filled with the Spirit. You can communicate in a word that, in a way that no demon can understand what you're saying. Only God understands. And they will pick up snakes with their hands, and they will drink deadly poison, and it will not hurt them at all. And that's referring to when you're in the ministry, if you are trying to, if people are trying to clandestinely take you out, God can protect you like he did on the Isle of Malta when, when the Apostle Paul, the enemy, tried to take him out with a shipwreck and he get, ends up on the beach in the pile of, and they're gathering sticks to the fire because, you know, those who serve God pick up sticks and work, right? Do we, we, we say amen to that? We don't sit around waiting for an opportunity to cast out a devil. We are out about Father's business, working with our hands and all that kind of stuff, but and the enemy sends a snake, a poisonous viper, attaches onto Paul's arm, and they all go, whoa, that's, that's a, that guy's a goner. And he goes, snake. <laughs> Falls into the fire. Nothing happens. Wow. God allowed that. And all of a sudden, they're all, you're all of a sudden, you're amazing. Well, tell us about what. And then he goes around praying for people. and saying, You know what? I love it when the enemy comes on, tries to take me out. Because do you know what he comes in? I stand up in Jesus' name. Oh, is that all you got? Thank you for reminding me I'm in a battle. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. And by the way, all of a sudden I'm, I'm in tune with God's spirit. And I'm, I'm, and I'm a quickened and made aware that it's not just this world, but there's a spiritual world of darkness. And they, they, they give me a little birth. They say, don't, don't touch him. Don't, don't, don't mess with him. Uh, do it sneak, sneaky, because this guy's going to end up coming out swinging the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, like Jesus did. Matthew 10, verse 8, and, and what goes on there in Matthew 16, 15 through 20, they will place their hands on sick people, and they'll get well. And after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven. It was the last thing he said. And he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied. That is what our path and wake does. When you obey God, there will be a wake of righteousness and a wake of freedom for people. In Matthew 10, verse 8, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Who does this? That's the question. Answer, you do. You and I. Those who believe, that is what we're supposed to say. And John 14, 12 through 14 says, I assure you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these, because I am going to my Father. What, whatever you ask in my name, I will do, so that the Father might be glorified in the Son for God's glory. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Is the power in the name? Is something magical about the sound of Jesus or Yeshua? Now, I respect that name. But the power is in not the, the audible sound of that name. Jesus and Yeshua, it was actually a, a common name in that time. You would hear in Jerusalem walking in the streets, you'd hear, Jesus, come on, or Yeshua, come in for supper. All of a sudden, all the demons tremble? No, because that was Yeshua. That wasn't Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior of the world, the person who we're referring to that has authority. So don't think that you can use it like an incantation. Jesus, Yeshua, or any derivative has no power in its sound. A group of people in Jesus' day found that out the hard way. In Acts 19, it says this, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Some Jews, with good intentions, I think, who went around driving out evil spirits, apparently they had some success, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, this is the latest, greatest way to do our, our shingle out in front of our house. We are exorcists, right? They tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they said, 
In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. <laughs> Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief, chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them. Jesus, I know, and I know Paul, but who the, who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped up on them and overpowered them all and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding Amen. oh I thought that name of Jesus would just work deliverance is not a game not a power trip it's a spiritual warfare and you better be prepared for that with a life of prayer the name of Jesus a cross or an incant as an incantation or an icon has no power. The power is in who it represents. It is in the authority of Jesus Christ that we invoke when we use the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior and Master. If we are not authorized to use it, it will not bring deliverance. But if you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you are authorized to use the name of Jesus. And spirits of darkness have to obey you, parents, as you speak quietly to your child. And you discern, manifest something that that is not my child that speaketh. Where would he have learned that? Why would they be saying and doing these things? There's no way. I don't let them watch TV. Yet they're saying things that are from the pit of hell in defiant rebellion against you. And then how do you handle that? You discipline children, but you cast out demons and you take authority over it. So what you do do, because they can't read your minds, you have to go in quietly under your breath so the child can't hear. And not with your face acting like you're talking to the child. You say, I right now in the name of Jesus. For one thing, I'd speak in tongues myself. All right? But I do. And the Holy Spirit will give you guidance as you do that. But then I say in the, under, under my breath, in the name of Jesus, every spirit of darkness, spirit of rebellious, and whatever the, the spirit of manifesting in that child, you, you stop right now. Cease and desist. That's in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You may have to walk out of the room, and, but out loud, so the demonic spirits, which are very aware of your authority, and they're manifesting themselves into your child. And you take authority and you say, no. Not in this house. Not in my house. Make sure you've cleaned the house. Make sure you're living in righteousness. Because you have no authority if you are living in the very sin that they are. If you end up yelling at your wife and her husband, if you end up sneaking around doing things you can't, you have no authority. Amen. It's the reason why your children have some of the problems. I'm not blaming everyone because I tell you what, I know some godly parents who are loving on Jesus and living what's right. And the thing is, is some, some, for some reason... That little child has been influenced, and at some point they may even have given in to, because they do give in to disobedience, so that a spirit of disobedience comes in, a spirit of lying because they perpetuate it, because it's willful. He can tempt them to lie, but he can't make them. They make a choice. Therefore, you discipline your child for their behavior, but you take authority over that spirit, and, and you keep it in check until they come to an age of accountability where they recognize they need Jesus as their Savior, and then you pray, and then at that time, but you may have to end up having years of dealing with a, with a young, young child until they actually come to the point where they need to repent. It happened with me. I'll tell you what. Can I have an amen for any of this? Amen. This is instruction practical, tactical instruction. And I, I know I've gone long, but I'm going to bring this to conclusion. The name of Jesus in the mouth of a Christian who's living for, in righteousness is a powerful weapon. Amen. Mark 16, in my name they will drive out demons. So how, how do you do it? How do you cast out a demon and set free those who are under the influence of evil spirits. Well, first of all, have them confess or acknowledge any sin that they may have opened the door to that spirit that oppresses them. They have to, with their mouth, acknowledge. Repent. Second, 
They need to renounce and ask God for forgiveness. To come in and say, God, we, I own it. Would you forgive me? Don't deny, hide, come, come, move away. And not, not me, it was someone else. The devil didn't make me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. Demons, all right? Third, command the demon to leave in the name of Jesus. Fourth, immediately invite the Holy Spirit to take up residence and fill the place that was vacated and rule that room in the house of that individual. And pray that God, and have them with their mouth invite God, please be Lord of that area. Then in accountability, make sure that they're following God's Spirit. And fifth, Instruct the person on how to stay free and be on guard against the return visit because the demon will come back to check if the space is occupied and Jesus is Lord of that area. Can I have an amen for that? I love it, even out of mouth of babes. Freely you have received, freely give. Set the captives free. You may have allowed areas of of anger, uh, jealousy, bitterness, unforgiveness. These are all the, the gluttony, lust, various carnal desires. You may have given in to some of those things on a consistent basis. And do you know what? You are again fighting not just the flesh, but you're fighting the flesh and a demonic attachment that you're enslavement to. I, you, that's the children's spread. This is for the church. This is a message for the church. If you come up here right now, I will pray for you. And I want you to quietly, because we're, before, because we're going to do a mass. A mass deliverance right now. All right? In fact, we do, do not have to come here, up here. I'm telling you. The Spirit of God is heavy on this place right now. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is on you personally. He loves you, and he wants you free. With the disciples, they could bring a hanky and they set people free. And so the Spirit of God is here, and by the finger of God, you can be free. But I want you to quietly take a couple seconds, and it won't take long because you know the sin. I want you to confess it before him. Acknowledge it and repent of it. Then I will speak in the name of Jesus. And I will, have, I will tell every spirit that is holding you to be gone in the name of Jesus. And it will leave because of the mighty name of Jesus. Because it was his intention for you to be free. And then I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will fill that room in your life. And that you will... Start walking in freedom and victory and celebrate and protect it and guard your rooms in the name of Jesus. Are you okay with that? All right. Make your confession before the Lord. Acknowledge your sin. Own your stuff. What what you don't own, the sin you don't own will own you. Acknowledge it and then repent of it. Tell God you're sorry. I will tell you, spirit of darkness, and this is personal for each one of you. I will tell you, spirit of darkness, that the word of God says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and forgives us our sins and will free us from all unrighteousness. So these individuals, these people you have tormented, they are free and forgiven. And they want nothing to do with your works of unrighteousness. They, do not, they want to be free, and they are not going not to ask you to be free. They are going to tell you, and right now all of us together say, in the name of Jesus, you leave every, everyone that is bound. In the name of Jesus, you leave every one of you. 
in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you leave. You tell it to go. You are unwilling to be in any way a host to unrighteousness. Say, I want to be a slave of Christ for there's life there. And say those words. I want to be a slave of Christ for there's life there. You give praise to God. And now you invite right now. Invite the Holy Spirit to take up residence where there's depression. And depression is a sin when you milk it. When you go there as a comfort and self-pity. I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus. I felt specifically a word for an individual, and you know who it is. I, right now, pray that the Holy Spirit would fill these rooms that they have invited the Holy Spirit to take residence in. I pray that you'd come in and you'd clean house, and that you'd set up a, 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 a wonderful presence of God, that, you, that they will be free, their conscience will be free because God has set them free. They are, they are children of God. I pray, Lord, that that area of their life will no longer be an area of defeat, but it will be an area of victory in the name of Jesus. I right now pray that the Spirit of God would fill and push out every spirit of darkness right now. I pray that it comes in like a flood and the enemy pushed out. It is uninhabitable to the spirit of darkness because it is filled with the light of God and His glory in the name of Jesus. I pray now, Lord, that there would be a spirit of transparency that they would tell their spouses in the areas where the spirit does tell them they're supposed to be honest so that accountability can happen, that there would be someone, the Bible says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. And I pray right now that that would also stick in their heart, that they'd get in relationship instead of hiding away in the name of Jesus. I pray now that they would be aware of spiritual darkness. As, but as they focus on Jesus, who is the light, I pray, Lord, they would be aware of those forces of darkness and that they would, with no fear, fight it with the word of God and command it to leave. I pray that there would be a wake of deliverance that follows each one of these who believe. That there will be freedom and power and manifestations of God's spirit and power and deliverance from the very ones who have been set free in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Church. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability.